capitalism, what makes the world go round and allows us to spend on some of the luxuries of life. President Obama is trying to rein in the worst excesses of free market capitalism with his reforms of Wall Street. But according to my guest on Hard Talk today, he's wasting his time. Professor David Harvey says capitalism is amoral and lawless and should be overthrown. Professor David Harvey, welcome to Hard Talk. Back in 2008, when you were watching banks collapsing in the autumn of that year, what were your thoughts? My first thought was, what took them so long? That actually I'd been thinking that there was going to be a crash from around 2003 onwards. And given my views of how capitalism works, and I know it's always crisis prone, I was just very surprised it hadn't happened earlier. It was inevitable. It was inevitable. And did you feel some sort of glee, some sort of I told you so as you watched? No, I didn't, because I, I know who gets hurt by these things. I mean, it's not as if uh, the rich folk really get hurt. In fact, they've been making a lot of money out of this crisis. The people who get hurt are ordinary people. And I saw immediately that we were likely to see all of these people losing their homes. And almost certainly there was going to be unemployment following. So I was not happy about it at all, even though I reckoned it was going to come. Now, you reckon it was going to come because, because you are a Marxist, would that be fair to say? I'm a sort of a Marxist, I guess. I read Marx a lot. I, I actually, and, and I like what he says, and I, I use his theoretical insights to try to dissect how capitalism works. And if that. you could boil it down to, to explain to somebody uh, as a belief system what it is? It's, how... it's not a belief system. It's, uh, it's an understanding of how capitalism works. It's uh, almost a scientific understanding of the nature of capitalism. There's a simple way in which you make money, which is you exploit labor in production in order to make more money. And if you make more money, you've then got the problem, what do you do with that more money? And there then arises what I call a capital surplus disposal problem. People have more money and they don't know what to do with it. So they have to then take it back and put money into making more money. And it's interesting, you look at how they've been doing that the last 30 years. Once upon a time, they used to put their money into production. Over the last 30 years, they've been putting it into buying assets and, and then actually leveraging their money into somebody else's money and then buying derivatives on derivatives of, of, of insurance on derivatives. So they've not been doing anything productive with it. They've actually been making money out of money. And, and, and this is why I thought to myself, this cannot continue. And this is why I was not at all surprised when there was a banking crisis. And your argument is that that making of money is to the benefit of a very small few. Yes, and you look who they are. I mean, and they're, they're still doing it. I mean, just a few weeks ago, the leading hedge fund managers in, in New York received $3 billion each for their activities in the middle of a crisis. When you look at where we are now, mm -hmm. 18 months later, Yes. With proposals for how to reform the system, President yes. Obama trying to get his yes. ideas through. Are those things that will improve the current system, in your view? They might marginally do a bit of good here, a bit of good there. But I don't think they're going to do anything fundamental and address what I see as the fundamental problems. And it's interesting, the reforms are all about the financial sector. And people are saying we're coming out of the crisis because the stock market is going up. But what's happening to employment? What's happening to people's jobs? Um, you know. Isn't that just a, something that lags but will catch up? Well, that's what they always say. And they said that in 2000 when there was a crash. And of course, nobody ever caught up. And in fact, nobody's been really catching up since the crisis of the 1970s. Wages have remained pretty stagnant. But since unemployment the 1970s. has improved? And it, well, em employment improved in the 1990s. Yeah, that's true. And, 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 uh, but then we had a jobless recovery after 2000. And we're in another jobless recovery right now. But when you look at what President Obama is proposing, he says, look, what he's, his ideas will mean an end to bailouts yes. because basically banks will end up paying for the mistakes within right, the industry. Right. And he's talking about a consumer protection bill, laws that will protect the consumer. Yes. Consumer protection is very, very important. The trouble is that, as I understand it, they're going to locate that inside of the Federal Reserve, which is a very bad idea. It's not going to be an independent agency. It should be a totally independent agency, not subject to the influence of the, the, the Federal Reserve. So that's the problem with that one. Bailing out the banks, yes. But actually, I think the big problem there is you have all of those banks which are too big to fail, and therefore they're going to create this monetary basis for themselves. And 
they're going to actually collar all of the business because in a sense they're going to be they're going to have a secure future knowing perfectly well that if they get into trouble they're going to be bailed out by their own funding to some degree small banks are not going to be bailed out at all there's a competitive disadvantage between small banks and the big banks okay so however this plays out he's trying to get his ideas yes. through past right. the american lawmakers mm -hmm. not having yes. much luck but however whatever conclusion they come to how do you think it will play out i think the party of Wall Street, as I call it, will win. And the party of Wall Street dominates Congress. And it dominates in the Democratic Party and in the Republican Party. So whatever comes out of this is going to come out in such a way that Wall Street may look as if it's suffering something, but actually is going to win. That is my prediction, okay? And if somebody wins, somebody loses? Yes, we lose. In what way? I think that what government policy has been about actually since 1980s in the United States has been always protecting the banks at the expense of the people. And they did that back in the 1970s, they did it in the 1980s, they've done it, they did it in the savings and loan crisis of 1997, 1987 onwards. So again and again and again they bail out the banks and we pay. But the argument for bailing out the banks is that it is um, helping the rest of it. It is ensuring that there are jobs, that there is money flowing through the system. Well, but we've bailed the banks out. I don't see money failing, sailing through the system right now. I mean, I, I just don't see it happening. The jobs are not materializing. What the banks are doing is actually building up their own assets, paying big bonuses and not actually lending. So what will happen to employment? It's going to remain stagnant for some considerable time, I think. It may even get worse. But you don't think that at some stage it will improve? I think, it, again, there may be some time. I mean, my guess is it's going to re be a real attempt on the part of the Obama administration to improve the employment rate as you come into an election. You know, and you can manipulate all kinds of things to make it appear as if things are much better. And then after the election, and particularly Obama's re-election, you'll find yourself back in unemployment again. But aren't politicians re-elected on the basis of how people feel about them and how they feel about them is whether they have jobs and their wealth? Yes, yes. Well, that's why you want to have employment rising just before you're in an election. And that's why you do everything you can. You prop up the economy to make sure. And that's why the Republicans are trying to stop it from happening. So there's a game played in Congress. Uh, which is about the political business cycle, not about you know, what's really necessary for the economy to revive. So whatever can happen, so long as it is and remains a capitalist system in any form, you think ultimately it will continue to fail? I think, no, it, it, fail is the wrong word. Stagger on from one crisis to another crisis. But only benefiting the and, wealthy. And, and, only benefiting the wealthy, as we see it at this moment. Now that can change if there's a political movement that said it's got to change, but I don't see the political movement that's going to stop it. Okay, well let's go back, go back to, the, to Adam Smith yes. and his yes. ideas <coughs> behind free market capitalism. Mm -hmm. Do you just not buy that idea that this is a system which could have mo maximum benefit for society because it's efficient? Adam Smith actually was giving advice to statesmen and he was saying to statesmen, if you want to grow wealth in your country, then you should actually work for the free market system. Adam Smith never said that the free market system should operate without state intervention and state supervision. Right the way throughout, he was saying to the statesmen, do this and then the country will get wealthy. And Adam Smith also said, and the wealth can then be spread around. That's what Adam Smith said. Now, I hear Smith quoted all the time and all of those aspects of Adam Smith are always left out. It always seems to be, they always say, Adam Smith was about a free market and the state should have nothing to do with it. No, but his, uh, that, that, but even if said. you accept what, if you accept what you're saying and that yes. what Adam Smith was about, yes. it still remains that he thought that free market capitalism yes. Not in this form, perhaps, right. but in the form he was suggesting was mm -hmm. the best system. Mm -hmm. Are you accepting that? No, I'm not. And I'll tell you a very simple reason. Because capitalism is about growth. And it's about 3% compound growth forever. I mean, that's, it, it varies a lot, of course. But that is the healthy capitalist system grows at a minimum at a 3% compound growth forever. And what we're talking about now is 3% compound growth on the basis of everything that's going on in the world right now. And you think what that means in 20 years' time, and you say, this is an impossibility. 
you have to find new investment opportunities right now for 1.5 trillion dollars. And if you keep on going at 3%, by the in 20 years time you're going to have to find new investment opportunities, profitable investment opportunities, for three trillion dollars. And, and where are those investment opportunities? Actually we've been running into problems of where the new investment opportunities are over the last 20 or 30 years, which is why many capitalists don't invest in production anymore. They don't invest in making real things. They, get, they just invest in controlling assets, like property. The property market goes, you know, like this, and stock market goes like this. They control resources, they become rentiers, you know, they control intellectual property rights and all those kinds of things. So they're not investing in real things, they're just investing in having more money made out of money. So your argument is go for zero growth. Go for zero growth and, and, and really redistribute at the same time. It's going to be a big, big kind of uh, problem to do, difficult to do. But people have to think about it. Okay, and well, I'm, I'm talk saying, us through this. You're saying think about this. Yeah. First, first of all, that idea of zero growth. How do you go for zero growth? I mean, goodness, it's hard enough as when they're aiming for a, a few percentage yeah. points growth. Well, one of the things I like to do is I like to distinguish between growth and development. And development is about investing in people's creative capacities and powers. You don't need growth to do that. So you could have zero growth, but at the same time you could also have radical transformations in, in, in education, uh, in uh, all sorts of... Uh, by redistributing the resources by that are redistributing. There. I mean, we have... You, you look at what, what, what have the rich people done with all of that money? They buy five mansions, you know, one in Bahamas, one in Long Island, one in Park Avenue, and you kind of go, this is ridiculous. This is ridiculous. We spread that wealth around and we educate but is people. it not already spreading around? I mean, when you look at what has happened as a result of capitalism yes. over decades, what yes. has happened to average wealth, average health, when you look at, I mean, lifespan, we're living, you yes. know, 1901, Right. People expected to live 45 till they were mm -hmm. 45, 49. Mm -hmm. yes. 1999, it was 75 to 80. Yes. Isn't that as a result of the benefits of capitalism? You know, one of the places that did that very, very well, exactly that, was China. And it did it without capitalism. Actually, life so, expectancy when Mao came to power was something like 35. And by the time he died, it was around 64, something like that. Infant mortality crashed in China under Mao. No, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not apologizing for Mao, I, I'm not a, a pro-Maoist, you know, but I'm saying you can do those things without capitalism. But if these are indicators, and you yes. look at what has yes. happened as a result yes. of capitalism, our life expectancy has increased, our wealth has increased, our leisure time has increased. Mm. I mean, and there's no, ju I mean, the judgment of happiness I'm putting to right, the side, right, because everybody's right, mind. But, right. but ha our leisure time, when you look back at over a hundred mm -hmm. years, mm -hmm. We have more time mm -hmm. to do what mm -hmm. we choose to do. Yes. Well, capitalism is a very, it has, been, has been a very, very constructive and productive force in history. I mean, I, I, I would never deny that, okay? Now we've got to the point where we have all of these things, and the big question is how can we actually utilize them in a way to contribute to human happiness and well-being and security? At the same time as you say all these things to me, do we live in a more secure world now than we lived in, say, even 30, 40 years ago? Do we live in a world which is where there's less anxiety than there was, say, you know, 30 or 40 years ago? I'd argue it's a more anxious place, it's a more frenetic place, it's a more insecure place, and, and people are quite literally scared. I mean, they hide themselves away in gated communities behind locked doors. I mean, what kind of world is that? Isn't there a problem, though, with when you look at the, the examples that there are of Marxist societies yes. or communists or you know, yes. extreme socialists is that the, the record of them is not great no. on all Agreed. the things that you're trying Agreed. to measure. Agree. I agree. I agree. I agree. And part of what I'm writing is to say we th therefore have to think about another kind of communism. A different kind of communism than the one that we ever constructed before. And we have to do a critique of those societies in order to come up with an alternative way of living to that which is given to us under capitalism. Okay, so paint I don't us know, your utopia. I, I paint us the ideal. We, you know, we'll, we'll put aside all the, the, the yeah, historical... I, I, well, I, I, you know, I can paint all kinds of I, I, uh, ideas. I would, I would say let's, let's have a decentralized kind of social world in which there are communities which are building themselves in the ways they want. In other words, there's a great deal of freedom of different communities to develop in their own particular way. In other words, we don't want homogeneity, we want actually diversity. We want the more diversity, the better. And actually one of the great things that capitalism has brought us also has been incredible 
diversity of populations in cities and incredible diversities of lifestyles. And I think that's a very, very positive attribute. Globalization yes, has been good. Has, has been, yes, it, it has helped, particularly the meshing of populations. But here we are, we know we've been discussing this for a while, and I've heard you commend various aspects of capitalism yes, as well as yes, criticize it. But yes, when you look back yes, as to the advantages, yes. I haven't heard you yet give an example of a communist society for which you consider a benefit and a good thing. If I was a medieval monk and you asked me to give you an example of what good capitalism would look like, I wouldn't have the faintest idea what to say, right? I, but you but reject, I, when I no, no, used the I, word belief but, earlier, but I, you rejected it. No, and that's why I no, wonder I, if it I isn't think, a belief. I think we can believe in, in processes of change. And one of the things I tried to do in the book that I've just written was to talk about the processes of social change, how the social change should occur. And the, 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 way, the, the method, if you like, of arriving at a better society than the one we are currently in. So where we end up, I don't see a utopia which is a fixed utopia. I think utopia is always about continuous change. And, and it, it's what I call a dialectical kind of vision of utopia, which is... And, and I remember I had a, had a really interesting conversation with, with a bunch of uh, theologians and a bishop about this. And I said, you know, people don't want to live in a society which is fixed. They want to live in a society where new things are going on all of the time. And, and therefore, the excitement of the new is constantly there. But the excitement of the new is not about new products which you sell. It's the excitement of creating new cultural forms, new forms of music, all the, you know, acting and all the rest of it. So that is, if you like, my utopia. And one of the things they said to me, you know, they said, well, you know, we've been having a problem with the Christian concept of paradise. They said it's so static and it's so boring that nobody wants to go there. So we have to think actually about paradise as a place where people actually do new things, where they create new things. I mean, human beings are astonishingly creative. And we've got to take the advantage of all of that astonishing creativity out of there and use it. Capitalism has now got to the point where it's not using that anymore. It's putting more and more people okay. into... You, know. you talk about the change, yes. and you have said in this book, capitalism will never fail on its own, it will have to be pushed. Yes. The accumulation of capital will never cease. It will have to be stopped. Yes. Capital class will never surrender its power. It will have to be dis dispossessed. Yes. I mean, what is that? A call to arms? Yes. A call for a revolution? Yes. Yes, yes of course. It's a, it, it, it's An a, overthrow of the... Of it's a, no, it's a, it's, a, it's a call for people to, to think about what the alternative must be because when you make this argument about 3% growth forever is impossible for environmental reasons, political reasons, social reasons and all the rest of it, when you say that, some alternative has to arise. And the only interesting question is what should it be? And to me, I'm kind of saying, well, the capitalists can de determine this. And the way they're doing it right now is by actually becoming richer and richer and richer. And unless we, the mass of the population, stop them... And do what? What are you calling for? Well, we, we stop them politically, by voting. We stop them democratically, and if necessary, we stop them in the streets. I mean, you have to think about this as a long process. OK, but you talk about the politics. As you made, you said yourself, there's no, there's no political movement for change. This is one of the big problems right now. Most of us are caught in this system where we, where we believe. I actually had a conversation when somebody said to me, I can imagine the end of the world more easily than I can imagine the end of capitalism. And you kind of go, what kind of thing is that? <laughs> and, and, and I'm saying, well, maybe we should be really imagining the end of capitalism and the construction of an alternative society. Lenin's so question of what is to be what done. What is to be done, yes. And, and, and you don't come up with an answer. But you, but you recognize that a lot of people will listen to you and they won't they look at what capitalism has brought them yes. and it, they may be sitting in yes. a house that yes. sure they've got a mortgage on but they own and mm -hmm. they think look this is good this is what i want i yes. want my flat yes. screen telly and my yes i'm sure there are a lot of people around like that but then there are two billion people in the world living on less than two dollars a day and they are not living in those houses and the big question is what is going to happen to them and how are they going to live and what are they going to do and we see for example in areas like latin america major movements in motion in Bolivia and Ecuador that are really beginning to change the world to a different kind of rhythm and a different kind of, of perspective. Sure, there are groups who, you know, you can yes. look at the, the Taliban, Al-Qaeda yes, will say, right. look, we don't want that. Right. But you will also have a lot of people who, poor, who think what I want and I am angry yes. and, and would fight to change it, but what but, I want is the house and the family. Yes, they may, they may indeed want that, but 
what we have to understand is the absolute impossibility of being able to have it. And therefore the alternative cannot be simply they join the capitalist system and become part of it. The absolute impossibility. You do yes. not buy that there is an ethical form of capitalism. Oh, there can be an ethical capitalism, although I'm waiting to see it, I have to say. Look at what's going on in these hearings in Washington right now and tell me it's ethical. <laughs> and that's crazy. But you're looking at the extremes. But Are they no, no, they're not the extreme. That's the center of the system. Come on, that's not an extreme. Uh, Goldman Sachs is not an extreme. Goldman Sachs is at the center of the system. And around them are all kinds of other people who are acting exactly the same way. So this is not a... This but the majority of the population of the Western world go to their jobs, they take home a, a, more, yes. a more typical wage, right. they, they are happy right. you know, in, yeah. in, in their right. lives, hoping for a pay rise. Yes. You're no, not, not the majority. There are people around who are like that. Yes, indeed. Um, but what you have to do is you have to start to, The reason I want to have this conversation is to say even to them, if they want to leave behind a world which is a better world their kids can live in with security and happiness and all the rest of it, would they simply say we continue doing the things exactly the way we are continuing to do them? And the answer I, might th I think that many of them would say would be, no, I think we really do need to change things. Okay, so, so your call is for people to wake up? Yes, and, and, and think about it and have a conversation about it. And if they don't, so, well, will they be forced to? Uh, I think, well, right now we are being forced to have conversations about things. I mean, we're now having conversations about derivatives and we never knew what they were three years ago. We're now having conversations about all kinds of things that we had to learn about because of the way this crisis has worked. So crises actually make us have conversations. But right now, the kind of conversation we're having about this crisis is, well, it was due to human failings, or it was due to institutional failure, or it was cultural failings. Nobody wants to say there's a systemic problem with the way in which capitalism works. And that's the kind of thing that I can talk about and I can demonstrate is indeed the case. Okay. And if that is the case, then we have to do something about capitalism. So, twen so 20, 50 years from now, yes. will we be living in a capitalist society? If we are, I think it would be a very unhappy place. It will be even more unequal than it is now. The environmental system will be absolutely in a total mess. Remember that 3% compound growth, and there's going to be 3% compound growth of, of asset uh, extraction and extraction of resources and energy consumption and all those kinds of things. It's not going to be a very nice place to live in. We probably will be wearing gas masks and all the rest of it, you know. So it's not a very, I, I, don't, I don't see it as a very happy place to be. And you can see signs of those problems all around us. And it's not only the environmental one, it's also the kind of social one the social inequalities and the way they're growing. You know, last year, in the midst of a crisis, the number of billionaires in India doubled. This is the sort of world you're living in, where you think that something is, is, is actually being equaled out, but actually the rich are getting incredibly much richer in, this, in the midst of this crisis. Professor David Harvey, thank you for coming on Hard Talk. Thank you.